Welcome, and in this lecture, I'm going to be going over Chapter 18, Section 1. And we're going to be looking at nomadic empires and Eurasian integration. So taking a look at the map that you see here, when we talk about Eurasia, we're referring to the region that is Europe and Asia. Often, it's also called Afro-Eurasia when you incorporate the Africa into this, into this whole network. And the term integration is giving us a hint that this region is going to be brought together. We've been studying different regions. We studied the Song and Tang dynasties of China. We looked at the empires in India. We looked at the Islamic empires, the East African city-states, as different entities. And in this chapter, we're going to see this region start to become more integrated. Now, before we begin you should prepare for notes. So on a piece of paper, you want to put the slide on pause and you want to divide your piece of paper into four sections. And this is going to be your assignment that you're going to submit to show that you've watched these lectures. So you're going to want to take notes on this particular video in the first box that says Turkish migrations. So you'll divide, you know, you'll take notes on nomadic societies and you'll take notes on Turkish empires. And the notes I want you to write are notes that you will understand as it relates to what I'm talking about. You don't have to copy everything I say. You don't have to write down what's on the screen. You just have to be able to understand the section. And in this particular case, for this video, understand the nomadic societies and the Turkish empires. And in the next video that you watch, you'll finish the rest. You'll do the Mongol, the Yuan, and Tamerlane and beyond. So now that you've copied this down, let's go ahead and get started. I want you to start by thinking of this question, how the geography, how did the geography of Central Asia affect the development of nomadic cultures? So everything we've been studying up to this point has been settled societies. All the empires that you've read about, those are settled societies, people who, who, who develop cities, they engage in um, artisanship, they engage in trade, you have urbanization where you have cities that reach the population sizes of a million, hundreds of thousands. And this is, you know, what most of world history has been about. You know, the Roman Empire, the Han Dynasty, these classical civilizations you read about, even the ancient Egyptians were settled societies. But to have a settled society, you need to have a lot of food. You need to have a surplus of food. And to have a surplus of food, you need agriculture. And to, need, to have agriculture, you need an abundance of water, fresh water from rivers, and you need the right climate. In Central Asia, the geography is semi-arid, and it is what are known as steppe vegetation, S-T-E-P-P-E. -E. And that consists of mostly grasslands. You get water enough to grow some grasses and shrubs, but not enough water to have lush vegetation. You could take a look at the map that you see here, and you know at the very bottom you see India, and then you see these tall mountains that divide India from the rest of Asia. Those are the Himalaya, and then to the west are the Hindu Kush. On the west of the map, you also see another high area, so the light brown is higher. The, the browner it is, the higher it is. Right, so those are, you know, that's the Iranian plateau, that's Persia. And then in the very bottom corner to the left, to the west, you, you see the, you know, parts of the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf. But if you go north of India, you see the Tibetan plateau, that, that's that area that looks like it's in white. That's very high and very mountainous. You know, that's where you see, you know, Mount Everest and all these high peaks. So it's, you know, up there it's too cold to really have a lot of... You know, you know, large centers of population. But north of that, we get the Central Asian steppes. And you can see from the color of the map, it's a lot of light brown, a lot of dark brown. So it's, you know, mountainous. It's up in the mountains. It's very high elevated. And then the pictures here, right, show you what that is like. So that does not mean, though, that people that live here are uncivilized. But the people that live in this region to survive here... They had to develop a different type of lifestyle, and that was a pastoral nomadic lifestyle. So they develop a livelihood that revolved around animals and around, you know, animal products. So they engaged in, you know, 
horsemanship, hunting. They became master archers. They developed, you know, these this rich pastoral culture, pastoral society. And so in a nomadic society, you have people that form tribes or clans. And clans are formed by people that have related languages. Because of the nature of the terrain, the people here have to herd animals. And when you herd animals, you move animals from one place to another because once they eat up all the grassland, you got to go find new pastures. So that's pastoral nomads. Because they move around in seasons to, to graze their animals. Um, cattle, sheep, goats. Um, and so they're going to move around. They're going to develop different languages. But because they're moving around and coming into contact with each other, they're also going to kind of share some common traits. Nomadic uh, economy also depended on settled societies because they sought trade. They were prominent on the caravan routes. When people went from the Abbasid Empire to China, they went through the steppes and they encountered the nomads. So the nomads were prominent on these trade routes and they engaged in trade with the people that came across them. So they also learned some words and parts of their language and, and culture. Um, one thing that's different in a nomadic society than in a settled society is that the social class is a lot more fluid. And that means that you could move up or down. In a nomadic society, you really only have two classes, nobles and commoners, and there's not much distinction between the two in terms of the way they dress because they all live a certain lifestyle. When you are a nomad, you have to pack your belongings onto pack animals, and you have to be able to move around thousands of miles of terrain. So you're not going to acquire a large house. You're not going to acquire property the way you would in a settled society if you built yourself a mansion, a castle. So the distinction was in as much. Um, and if you were very helpful to the group and prominent and, and you gained respect either through horsemanship, through war, you could move up. And if you didn't, you could move down easily. So these clans tended to be autonomous. They tended to, you know, they tended to kind of govern themselves and each clan and each tribe kind of ran its own group, small groups of people. Their religion was varied based on who they came into contact with. Most most pastoral people were um, shamanistic. They believed in animism and in these nature spirits. Societies tend to develop belief systems around their source of food. Agricultural societies depended on rivers and rain and crops. So early religions that developed in settled societies, you end up having like the god of rain, the goddess of this, the sacrifice to for the rain or for the, for the fertility of the land. So in pastoral society, it was a lot around animal spirits. But you, because of their prominence on the Silk Roads, they came into contact with Christians, with Buddhists, with Muslims. And so some of them adopted the religions or sometimes blended the religions that they came into contact with. By the 10th century, Islam becomes very prominent because a lot of the nomadic people live on the borderlands of the Abbasid Caliphate. So another question to think about is how did nomads adapt to their environment and what advantages did their adaptations give them? So oftentimes people overlook nomadic societies and think they are not as advanced, think they're not as sophisticated as these civilizations, and that's incorrect. So there were some advantages and the fact that they adopted to this lifestyle really shows how humans, you know, no matter where we go, we tend to figure out a way to live within our environment. Uh, when you're thinking of the spice theme, this is that spice theme of human environment interaction. So the nomads adopted to their environment in different ways in the construction of their homes. You could see the picture here. These are modern day, there are still pastoral nomads today, right? And they still live in yurts. These homes are called yurts. And they're made of animal skins. And when you need to move your animals, you could pack up your house and put it on top of your pack animals and move it to your next location. So nomads drove herds into migratory cycles, like I mentioned earlier, and they live mostly on animal products. Okay, milk, cheese, meat, drying the meats, right? Things like jerky. Um, and then they had some limited amounts of grain, of millet. They did have some pottery to store some grains. And then they would trade leather goods, you know, leather hides, uh, armor, um, clothing, coats, 
So they traded with the people that that did transverse their lands on their way from one you know large civilization or empire into another. And so in this chapter, it looks at the building of these empires. So throughout history, we've like I said, we focused on the civilizations, but between about the year 1000 and the year maybe 1500, in that 500 year period of world history, nomadic people are going to have a profound impact on the course of history. And, you know, a lot of people say that this is the birth of the modern world, the, the rise of nomadic empires during this particular period is going to give birth to the modern world. And so that's what this chapter is going to going to focus on, because these these empires are going to take over these settled societies. We have expansions conquering Song China, conquering the Abbasid, and making these societies overlap. Having one person control the land that used to belong to multiple empires now under one empire, this is going to lead to the, an increase in trade, in interaction, in communication and in the traveling of one place to another. So we begin by looking at the Turkish expansion into Persia and India. So the Turks come from Central Asia. On this map, if you see where the uh, Aral Sea is, if you take a look and you find the Aral Sea, the Caspian Sea, that area, that's Central Asia, those are the Central Asian steppes. Samarkand, that city there, uh, along the Silk Route. This is the homeland of Turks. And Turks are a group of people, nomadic people. They have different tribes, different Turkic languages, but they have some common roots, who organized themselves in the clans. And they had, you know, each one had their own ruler, a Khan, very small. But because at this time we see the expansion of, for example, the Abbasid Empire, you're going to see Turks begin to expand into settled societies, and they're going to start to adopt their religion. They're going to convert to Islam the more they begin to go into Abbasid territory, and then the more Muslim merchants begin to go into their territory on their way to China to trade. And so this expansion is going to lead to the formation of multiple Turkic empires. And one of the more prominent ones are the Seljuk Turks. And you see from the map, you know, the heartland of the Seljuks over by the Caspian Sea. Between the mid 8th and 10th centuries, they're, they're living on the border of the Abbasid Empire, and they're going to begin to trade with the Abbasids. They're going to join the Abbasid army. They're going to learn their fighting techniques, and they're going to eventually establish themselves as a pretty powerful force within the Abbasid military to the point where they're going to start to develop their own autonomy. They're going to start to control themselves. They are also going to um, go into the lands that were the Byzantine Empire. So when you see this map here, you can see... In orange, that land was the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is what was left over when Rome fell. The Roman Empire fell in the year 476. The city of Rome fell. But the Roman Empire continued. They moved it to the capital that you see here, that square on the, on the map that says Constantinople. That was a city named after the Roman Emperor Constantine. So by the year 300, Constantinople was the new center of the Roman Empire, and Rome was no longer as important in the Roman Empire. And by 476, it, it was attacked, but the Roman Empire continued. Uh, in fact, in Eastern Europe, we have a country called Romania, right? That's what it gets its name. They didn't call themselves the Byzantine Empire. Historians call them the Byzantine Empire. They still called themselves Roman. They still had Roman emperors. They had arenas in Constantinople. They had chariot races. So all of that was still happening. But as the Abbasids gained more power, they slowly began to you know, creep into the land of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire, by the year 1000, is a lot weaker. And so when the Seljuk Turks enter, they're entering into a weakened version of the Roman Empire, of the Byzantine Empire. And in 1055... Tugril Beg is recognized as the sultan by the Abbasid Caliph. And they begin to make their, you know, they begin to establish a powerful state in, form, in lands that were under Abbasid control, only now they were Abbasid in name only. The real power was with the Turks. And their successors extended their rule into Syria 
and Palestine, lands that were once Roman. So they begin to migrate into Anatolia, into the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century. And in 1071, they defeat the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert. They take the emperor hostage, and they begin to establish themselves as the power, and, be, and they start taxing the Byzantine church and start confiscating property. The peasants there saw the Seljuks as liberators because the people who lived in this region, and in this region, it's the region you see in the light orange and the darker orange, okay, that very red part, that very reddish orange, that was what was left by 1450 of the Byzantine Empire. Most of it had fallen already to the Turks. And so today, this land, and you see the map there, it says present-day Turkey. Today, that area is Turkey. Constantinople is now named Istanbul. So the city of Istanbul was once a Roman capital. And the Turks begin to make their way in in the 11th century. That's where we get the name Turkey. But Turks are not originally from this land for, of Anatolia. And so they displace the Byzantine authority. And little by little, we're going to see the fall of the Byzantine Empire. And we're going to talk about that in, the, in, in Section 3 when we talk about the Ottomans. Another group of Turks, and we already saw this when we went to India, were the Ghaznavid Turks and the Afghan Turks. And so this was the, the, the group, the clans of Mahmud of Ghazni. And Mahmud is the, the, the Turkish or the Persian um, version of the name Mohammed. Right? So the Ghaznavids had already converted to Islam. And these are the ones who, who invaded northern India and they attacked Hindu and Buddhist temples and, and their shrines. They stripped Hindu and Buddhist establishments of their wealth and they repressed the religions to promote Islam. And they eventually established the Sultanate of Delhi. And remember, we talked about that in chapter 16. So, so this is all the context of when this is happening. This is the Turkic expansion and, consequently, the spread of the Turkic language as well. And so when, as these Turks are not just migrating, but they're taking over lands that were once settled, that were settled societies, they begin to adopt the ways of the settled people, but they also begin to implement some of their own culture, some of their own political organization. But more importantly, they're helping diffuse language, technology, and culture. And we're going to see that happen a lot more in Section 2. Section 2 is really long, so the next video is going to focus a lot on Section 2, and then I'll touch on Section 3 in the video on the Mongols. So that is it for this one. The rest of the notes on that chart you're going to take from the next video. So make sure that you watch the next video now. All right. I will see you.